Hi, today we greet you in Kiswahili with a song called Jumbo, which is from Kenya. Jumbo, Jumbo Bwana, Habarigani, Mizuri Sana, Wageni, Wagarebishwa, Africa Yetu, Hakuna Matata, Hakuna Matata. Hello, my name is uh, Brynjolf Stige. I'm professor of music therapy at the University of Bergen in Norway. And it's a pleasure for me to moderate this spotlight session on ethical challenges in music therapy. Ethical challenges emerge within interpersonal relationships as well as within relationships between profession, organization, community and society. There are limitations to our emotional and cultural sensitivity and interests and horizons are not always shared. So clashes of values are inevitable. How much of a problem is that? Can a clash of values at times open a space for communication instead of closing it? Ethical dilemmas clearly go beyond the challenge of relating to another person. Questions of moral performance are also about social change. Unfair distribution of resources and access represent important ethical challenges. In other words, ethics is not only about personhood, it's about citizenship also. In this spotlight session, we will soon have four pre-recorded presentations. Each one will last for 25 minutes and the presenters will be shown one after the other. After the presentations, the panel of four presenters and myself as the moderator will be shown live for a discussion lasting about 20 minutes. The chat function will be open throughout and active, so you are welcome to type in questions as the presentations are playing. Let me then introduce the four presenters. The first presenter is Verdi van Staden, who is Professor of Philosophy and Psychiatry and Director of the Center, Center of Ethics and Philosophy of Health Sciences at the University of Pretoria. He holds postgraduate qualifications in psychiatry, philosophy and music. He chairs the world's psychiatry Psychiatric Association sections for philosophy and humanities. And he's also a composer and principal flautist of the Pretoria Symphony Orchestra. Verdi will talk about values diversity as challenge in the ethics of music therapy. The second presenter is Dr. David Bates, an American board certified music therapist who works as a clinician, manager, researcher, and educator. She is the music therapy manager at the Cleveland Clinic and also provides music therapy at the Tosic Cancer Institute. She's an adjunct professor both at Augsburg University and St. Mary of the Woods College. 
Debbie will talk about AMTA's transition to a new aspirational code of ethics. Our third presenter is Dr. Amy Clements Cortes from Canada, who is Assistant Professor of Music Therapy at the University of Toronto, instructor and supervisor at Wilfrid Laurier University, and academic coordinator and instructor at Ryerson Chang School. She is a credentialed music therapist, a registered psychotherapist, and also a fellow both in the Bunny method of GIM and in neurologic music therapy. Amy has extensive clinical experience and is the outgoing past, past president of the World Federation of Music Therapy. Amy will talk about medical assistance in dying, challenges, considerations, and implications for music therapists. Our fourth and final presenter is Dr. Andalin Dos Santos, who is a music therapy lecturer and research coordinator at the University of Pretoria. She's a registered music therapist and her research interest lies in, the ex in exploring empathy and violence from interpersonal aggressive encounters to the structural violence of racism and colonialism. She is particularly interested in how the investigation of violence and empathy shifts when using the thinking tools offered by diverse theories and research methodologies. Andaline's title is Ethical Empathies in Music Therapy Training and Beyond. I hope that you will find these four presentations stimulating and I welcome you back to the discussion that will follow. Thank you. Good day, I'm Barry von Staden. I hope this session will be a very rewarding session where you will be attaining a better understanding, I hope, and even improved skills. Um, I'm going to talk to the topic, values, diversity, as challenge in the ethics of music therapy. We're going to begin with a practical exercise which I would really like you to participate. It's a simple activity, um, because if you actually do it, you'll really get the point. Also afterwards, um, to ponder the implications of, of this exercise is what I would really like to encourage you to do. I ask you to make a list of four words that describe a good strawberry. I think you could do this very quickly, presuming that you've got good knowledge of a strawberry. So I'll give you 20 seconds to do this. Good. Now, also a familiar concept, I hope, a good music therapist. Four words that come to your mind in describing a good music therapist. Again, I will give you 20 seconds to do so. Your answer may be 
like this. A good strawberry, you may say that it's red, sweet or not too sour, and firm, it's not too strongy, no blemishes. Difficult to argue that this is a good strawberry. A good music therapist could look at your list. Usually people give various kinds of answers here, like, you know, someone is knowledgeable, skillful, much musical abilities, sensitive, um, engaging, caring, and we make a carry on with quite a long list. The question is, which, if it has to be only four, which, which should it be? And we've got two comparisons, or comparison between two items here, so to speak, good strawberry, good music therapist. And if we compare the list, you may see that we may all agree fairly easily what a good strawberry is. But it's a bit more challenging to decide on four words for a good music therapist. Even though we're talking about good, the quality we're looking after is captured by the same word, good. Well, of course, you may say, well, a music therapist is clearly not a strawberry. And who would have thought a music therapist is a strawberry? Duh. Um, the deeper point here, however, is how do people think about what a good music therapist? Do they think similarly to a strawberry? How do you think about your colleagues? They should be good in the way that you reckon you want to be a good therapist. And think about how clients think about what would be a good music therapist. What this exercise has been showing is that some concepts are more value-laden than others. Some domains have more embedded values than others. And this is not merely a, a, a contingent societal attribution, but as a necessity, what comes with the concept, what it is in its essence, a good strawberry or a good music therapist. We can extrapolate from the example that there are two general kinds of values. One kind, by one kind, we share values. Those values are shared values. They are convergent values. We agree about those. They even appear like facts. For example, what would be a good strawberry? Legal values, laws, codes, regulations, frameworks typically capture this kind of value, the values that we share. But other values are legitimately diverse. We will not agree about those. For example, what would be a good music therapist? The client may have a very different view. Even among music therapists, uh, they will be diverse to be about what could constitute a good music therapist. Also, aesthetic values are typically diverse. What counts as a good composition? What counts as a, um, a beautiful piece of music? Um, what is too, what is a too dominant feature? What is, counts as a beautiful? Uh, harmonic resolution, um, we've got different values about that. So these diverse values are the complex values. They cause the unease, they are inconsistent, they are quite often uncertain and contentious. Having distinguished between diverse and shared values, you may ask, what has that distinction got to do with ethics? I want to show to you that when people usually think about ethics, they think about the shared values in neglect of the legitimately diverse values. For example, people think of ethics in terms of prescription obligations, which of course ethics is about prescription obligations as well, you know, the duties, the things we ought to do. Certainly ethics got to do with rules and regulations and human rights and codes of conduct and oaths and declarations, standing against crime, these are all shared values.
Also in ethics generally, we see that it's mainly about shared values. In deontology, which is about duties deriving from, from Immanuel Kant's work, it's about what our duty would be by a common standard, the shared value. Again, consequ consequences. Um, in consequentialism, concerned about the consequences of this or that action, uh, it's again whether the consequence is good or bad is determined by a shared value, a common value, a common standard of what would be a good consequence or a bad, good, uh, bad consequence. In liberal individualism, it's about our rights, again, our shared values as captured in rights. Communitarianism as about those values that we treasure as a community. Again, shared values. Virtue ethics, again, what counts as a virtue is, to t is by a common standard. What would be excellent in Aristotelian ethics, what would be excellent by a common standard. Care-based ethics, there the shared value is that of care. But of course, there's a particular kind of virtue ethics. We see similarly when we focus on health ethics rather than ethics in general, when we focus on health ethics, that the values are principally about shared values. In the principalism of bioethics, the four principles really capture the shared values respect for personal autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and distributive justice. Also casuistry, which is a way of looking at previous cases similar to the, the one in question, and then to uh, find the shared or common value that may be pertaining um, in previous cases when looking at the current case. Again, it's about shared or diverse values, or shared values rather than diverse values. So you may ask, does it matter? Are we not okay without, bo without bothering about diversity of values? Are the shared values not enough of a challenge already? And I think you already sensed with that exercise that the shared values are not enough. We need to account for diversity of values as well. And I think you also spot now a, a huge neglect or, or gap in uh, ethics by it's not dealing properly with conflicting values. Before looking at this distinction, where, it, where why it matters, we need to just quickly take a look at what are values and where do they fit in music therapy. The question, what are values, may be approached by asking what kinds of values do we get? And you see there are various kinds of values. Sometimes people think too narrowly about values. When we talk about values, they only think about what's right and wrong, but clearly what is good and bad and better and worse would also count as values. Some values are virtues. All virtues are values, but not all, all values are virtues. Honesty is an example of a virtuous value. Um, but that you shouldn't kill, for example, is a legal value. Um, some values are ideals, they're aspirational, but other values are not like that. For example, you shouldn't kill someone, it's hopefully not just an aspiration. Some values are personal, some values are societal, we even have scientific values. Some values are professional, some values are religious values, some values are cult cultural some values are aesthetic, what counts as a good painting, what counts as a good composition, what counts as a beautiful piece of music, for example. A brief look at what do we mean with the concept of values. So, but where are these values in play when it comes to music therapy? We may look at this question but laterally, beginning at or looking at evidence-based medicine, the foreword of the book on evidence-based medicine by Sackett 
and his colleagues uh, who are the champions of evidence-based medicine, it spotted clearly that it's about clinical decisions. It's about clinical decisions. That is where the values come into play. Quite often people quote the first bit of in this definition of evidence-based medicine, you know, it's about best research evidence and the pursuit of best research evidence. But they say in their foreword that it's the integration of that best research evidence with clinical expertise and patient values. And these come together in clinical decisions, which is well spotted by them. It's also interesting to see that at the heart of evidence-based medicine, it's about values. It's not just about any research evidence, it's about the best research evidence. So value is really at the heart of evidence-based medicine, not just in the integration with personal values and clinical expertise, but really at the heart of the research evidence that is meant to be applied clinically. In decision theory, it's well established that what makes for a decision is that it is necessarily value-driven. No, a decision must have a value component to it, even if hidden. Um, and that means that all decisions in music therapy necessarily have a value component. We may depict the field where values are in play in music therapy in this way. I've spoken quite a bit so far on, on the values, this bit, but let's just quickly look at music therapy um, just to have a good idea of what the, the field is. So, and this I'm sure you recognize very easily, this is what music therapy is about. It's about the professional behavior towards colleagues, towards clients. It's about assessment and the various aspects which you can easily spot there. And clearly, decisions are everywhere in all of these aspects of music therapy. But in ethics, the emphasis is usually on professional behavior, so-called professional ethics, or on treatment, or in research, but do spot that that's not exhaustive. Those areas in red are not exhaustive of the scope of music therapy where decisions are really relevant, where values matter. Values matter also in those other decision-making aspects of music therapy. But values are in the center of every decision contrasts with this view of values being on the outskirts, on the periphery, which is clearly mistaken. Values are not there just to provide some finesse on the outskirts or some sugar coating of sorts. That would be a mistaken idea. As a matter of fact, one may say values are at the center of signs and not just on the periphery, because signs are necessarily constituted by decisions. This is similarly a mistaken way of thinking about values, as if a mere appendix, you know, that rather useless bodily organ, which is only of concern when you when it makes you ill with an appendicitis, when it's nauseating, but generally you don't need to bother much about it. Now that would be a mistaken way of thinking about values. So, what do we do when diverse values clash? And this I can just quickly visit, because this is where the challenge is, and of course this is the challenge rather neglected in um, usual writing and thinking in ethics. I present to you four ways of dealing with this challenge, three unsatisfactory ways, and a fourth way that I advocate. The first way to deal with this challenge is actually not dealing with it at all, by simply denying it. The second option is to force some kind of convergence 
and we may do that by going for the general average view or try to make the particular view as perspective free as possible, try to get some common endorsement for a value through research, for example, or to try to establish consensus and say, you know, everybody agrees that a good music therapist will be so-and-so, or the average view is that a music therapist should be so-and-so, and henceforth those values, or that value is the most, um, is, is the going value, that is the convergence. But that, as you can see, would really erode the diversity. Perhaps a more scary way of forcing a convergence is to say, well, we or I am right and the rest are wrong. They should simply abide with what I say or what we say. We are right, they are wrong. We perform some kind of totalitarian coup. For example, we all know that a good music therapist is a knowledgeable one. Everybody should simply know that that's the most important value when it comes to a good music therapist. You can hear how that coup is quashing legitimate values. The same goes for making inappropriate rules and regulations, trying to get people to converge to a value as if universal or the standard take. The third unsatisfactory way of dealing with this challenge is to say anything goes, whatever. This is akin to ethical relativism and not sustainable, eroding the very values that we stand for in the end. The fourth way to deal with the challenge of diversity of values is to begin with a, a high regard for the differences and account for all the re relevant values. The values that are converging as well as particularly those values that are clashing, the values that are in conflict. And this option entails that we subject those clashing values, those differences, to a process. This process is captured in values-based practice. Values-based practice is the theory and skills space for effective healthcare decision-making where different and potentially conflicting values are in play. Note that it, we talk about values in the plural, values in the plural, because it's about diversity. We cannot speak of diversity of a singular value. It has to be about values in the plural. My colleague Bill Fulford has developed this in more detail, uh, lots of detail, if you would like to read more on, on this. Usually when we have a professional difficulty, we go to a book, we go to the shelf, so to speak, and find the book in which we hope to find an answer. But with a clash of values, we quite often won't find the answer in some kind of textbook on the shelf. We will really have to submit those clashing values to a process. To this end, values-based practice provides guidance, and it says we should begin with a high regard for the differences. We should take the differences really, the differences of values, really seriously. This is not to say we have high regard for all the values. As a matter of fact, it's very difficult to have high regard for a value with which you totally disagree. If you find a value, for example, revolting, you cannot ha hold it in high regard. If you say you respect that value with which you've got, which you find revolting or disagree, at best that would be um, tokenism. It would be um, lip service, it's not really respect of the kind by which one would hold something in high regard. Just, just note that distinction there. Similarly, it's not the same to say that if I've got high regard for the differences, I've got high regard for all and everyone. Having high regard for all and everyone may be just too challenging in a specific instance where that person is doing something again. Revolting, for example, someone who has committed atrocities, for example. The point is, the point of, of uh, our starting point here is much more humble. Just take the differences seriously without aspiring to um, 
the much more challenging thing that is to have a, necessarily a high regard for the particular value or a high regard for the um, for, for all and everyone. So what do we practically do when we've got this clash of values? What is this process? That this process that we have to do rather than, for example, find the answer from a book on the shelf. This process involves, crucially, communication. And not just communication where the communication is a means to an end, but where the communication is an end in itself. This communication has to be about the values, specifically our differences of values, the values that are different um, in this particular decision-making process. Of course, this requires skills. We need to be aware of the values, recognize the, recognize the values in play, and deliberately create a space for values, hearing the values of each other in that situation. The attitude is really important in dealing with this clash of values, because the values are opposing. But that doesn't mean that you and I, with different values, need to be in opposition. That is our natural tendency to think if you disagree with, with what are my value, that you disagree with me. But we can be more mature than that and say that even though our values are clashing, we can remain on the same side. So we can remain in that position even when our values are in opposition. The expectation that should drive this process of communication is that we want to come to a shared decision. We want to come to a decision in partnership. Partnership, we may need to perhaps highlight with an example the kind of partnership we've got in mind here. Let's say you and your colleague practice in partnership and there's an application for a new receptionist and you think that this new receptionist, this applicant will be really a good receptionist, whereas your partner reckons that the receptionist would not be good for the, for the practice. Um, the, this receptionist or this applicant will be potentially bad for the practice. What will you do? Here you've got a clear clash of values. How will you make that decision? Of course, you will have to take each other seriously for your respective values. Because what you reckon, your values, she would be good. And you may have very good reasons to say so. And your partner, similarly. So one way would say we have to convince each other. But that is quite often asking one or the other, you or the partner, you or your partner to relinquish um, your value or your partner to relinquish her or um, his value in this matter. Another way would say, well, let's, what are we going to consider? What are we going to decide considering our differences? And there you have to be creative and realize if you say it has to be my way or no way that you may actually be damaging the relationship and actually the interest of the partnership, particularly if you persistently do so one decision after the other. Um, so a better, more mature way would say let's take each other seriously and be creative about what we decide. So we may decide, for example, that let's do a probational appointment and then reassess the situation in six weeks and then uh, your partner may be happy with that arrangement because your partner's value has not been quashed in the process. It's actually been taken seriously. Or another creative ability would be, so, well, let's not appoint Mary. Let's appoint the second person, the second candidate, because we both think that that second person would be um, the, you know, the best for the practice. If you think about... If you and your spouse, for example, disagree about where to go on holiday, it quite often has to be a similar process where you have to take the other one seriously without asking the other person to relinquish what would be his or her favorite or most desired holiday, for example. So I 
Thank you very much for participating. Hi, it is an honor to be one of the spotlight speakers on ethics for this World Congress. Um, ethics is a topic that I've been passionate about for almost my entire career. So I'm very grateful to the World Federation for this opportunity. What I'd like to talk about today are some of the current trends in professional ethics in the US. Um, and one of those trends for us is our aspirational code. But before I talk, uh, before I dive into that a little bit, I would like to ask you to think about this word ethics for just a minute. Um, consider what it means to you. Um, if we were all together, I would ask you to fill in the sentence, ethics is. Um, if you want to put your responses in the chat box, that would be awesome. Um, but maybe when you, when you think of ethics is, maybe it's words or phrases um, that complete that sentence. Or maybe it leads you down a memory of an ethical dilemma that you had to work through. Um, or maybe it raises awareness of feelings that you associate with this word or, or with those, those dilemmas that you worked through. So just take a moment to consider that. And I would like to talk, like I said, about some of the current trends in the US. Um, our aspirational code of ethics is still fairly new to us. Um, and, and before I get into the content of the presentation, I think it's important to acknowledge that ethics is absolutely context dependent. So the information that I'm sharing is absolutely influenced by the fact that I'm a music therapist who lives and works in the United States. <clears throat> so we know that the primary purpose of a code of ethics is to safeguard the welfare of clients. Perlihy and Corey identified um, different objectives for a code of ethics. One of those was to educate professionals about sound ethical conduct. And I think the important word here is educate, which focuses on reading and reflecting on standards that help practitioners to expand their awareness and clarify their values in dealing with challenges in their work. Another objective is to provide a mechanism for professional accountability. And I think accountability is the important word here. Practitioners are obligated to monitor their own behavior and to encourage ethical conduct in their colleagues. And codes of ethics can serve as a catalyst for improving practice. And I think improving is really the important word here. When practitioners interpret and apply codes of ethics in their own practices, the questions raised help to clarify their positions on dilemmas that do not have simple or absolute answers. Because if it had a simple or absolute answer, it wouldn't be an ethical dilemma. So as we think about aspirational ethics, it's important to understand that there are different types of ethics. One type of ethics is principal ethics, which is a set of obligations and a method that focuses on moral issues with the goals of solving a particular dilemma or set of dilemmas and establishing a framework to guide future ethical behavior. Principal ethics focus on acts and choices and are used to facilitate the selection of socially and historically acceptable answers to the question, what should I do? Principal ethics asks, is this situation unethical? Whereas virtue ethics focus on the character traits of the helping professional and the non-obligatory ideals to which professionals aspire, rather than on solving specific dilemmas. So virtue ethics asks, am I doing what is best for my client? So you can hear that there's a difference in focus. Principal ethics is really about the situation and what the therapist should do. Um, whereas in virtue ethics, the focus is on whatever is in the client's best interest. Even in the absence of an ethical dilemma, virtue ethics compels the professional to be conscious of ethical behavior. Principal ethics and virtue ethics are not mutually exclusive, though. Helping professionals should strive to integrate virtue ethics and principal ethics to reach better ethical decisions and policies. So when we think about ethical, I'm sorry, when we think about levels of ethical practice, um, 
At one end of the spectrum, we have mandatory ethics, which is a level of ethical functioning where helping professionals act in compliance with minimal standards. So mandatory ethics acknowledge the basic shall and shall nots. And the focus is on behavioral rules, such as providing informed consent in professional relationships. At this level, practitioners are safe from legal actions in courts of law or professional censure by licensing or accrediting bodies. At the other end of the spectrum, we have aspirational ethics. These are the highest standards of thinking and counseling that helping professionals might seek. Aspirational ethics seeks to do the best we can and take the moral high road in all situations. Rather than focusing on meeting minimal professional standards, the aspirational approach asks the helping professional to aspire to achieve the highest ideals of the profession. So you can hear that this is in aspirational ethics um, they're lofty. It's like a ceiling, but it's a ceiling that is constantly moving. Um, and, and it's a thing where, where we never really arrive. We're always striving to do better. And related to this idea is positive ethics that focus on how, how helping professionals can harm clients and how they can do better at helping them. Positive ethics require helping professionals to anchor their professional behavior and decisions in a broader and overarching ethical philosophy that asks what they could do, not simply what authorities say they should do. Positive ethics is not linked to any one ethical theory. Adherence of positive ethics can be found among those who endorse virtue-based ethics, deontological ethics, feminist ethics, and other ethical theories. So for that reason, um, because of this broad applicability, I think that aspirational ethics are also applicable to music therapists regardless of the theoretical orientation from which they practice. Um, Knapp, Gottlieb, and Handelsman say that it's important to acknowledge that positive ethics and mandatory ethics are not mutually exclusive. According to the positive approach, however, ethical practice not only requires the helping professional to know and obey the rules, but it also asks them to consider how they can maximize the implementation of the values of the profession, as well as their own personal values within the context of their professional roles. So we're integrating the rules, regulations, and standards that govern our work with our own overarching or aspirational ethical ideas. So what is an aspirational code of ethics? It requires that helping professionals do more than meet the letter of the code. It entails an understanding of the spirit behind the code of ethics and the principles upon which the code of ethics rests. And it always focuses on the client's best interests. So at this level, practitioners go farther and reflect on the effects their ethical interventions may have on the welfare of their clients, or perhaps on each other, depending on what the, what the ethical dilemma or ethical issue is. So for example, from an aspirational perspective, it might be interesting to think about or to weigh the pros and cons um, in terms of what's in the individual client's best interest when trying to decide whether or not to provide telehealth or virtual music therapy visits. Or under this aspirational ideal, it might be interesting to consider our responsibilities as professionals to support colleagues and clients who are part of marginalized communities. Some of the advantages of a positive approach it may increase the sensitivity to ethical issues that professionals encounter every day because they are more likely to consider the larger ethical dimensions of their actions. The range of situations and available alternatives and ethical deliberations becomes wider because the standard for judging behavior is now the extent to which it can be anchored on an overarching ethical theory. It may motivate students to pursue higher standards of conduct and promote a higher level of patient care. Um, sometimes learning about ethics can be a little anxiety, provo um, anxiety provoking for students and students may be at risk of adopting that floor approach and that, that mandatory minimal standards kind of ideal. And so um, in, this, in this 
positive aspirational approach, the ideas of ethical and unethical are replaced or augmented between, um, by the ideas of ethically adequate versus ethically excellent. A positive approach may also increase motivation to follow the spirit as well as the letter of the ethics code because the code also reflects one's own personal values. So professionals might be less likely to see a code as a document that's created externally and imposed, imposed upon the professionals and more likely to seek ways to integrate the ethical foundations of their personal lives with those of their professional roles. So let's talk a little bit about the new code of ethics in the US. So we'll play a little game. Should I stay or should I go? All right, so the way this is gonna work is I'm gonna show you a few topics and decide if you think that it stayed or if it went. And if you wanna type stay or go in the comments, feel free. Confidentiality, did it stay or did it go? If you type stayed, you're correct. Non-discrimination, did it stay or did it go? This one also stayed. Increased public awareness of music therapy. Did that stay or did that go? That one went. Um, the ethics board felt that while increasing public awareness of music therapy and advocacy were professional responsibilities, they were not, this is not something that's an ethical issue. Fee splitting, did it stay or did it go? It went, and this is actually, this particular topic or item is related to part of the rationale for why we have a new code of ethics, and I'll talk a little bit more about that um, in a minute. Self-kindness, did it stay or did it go? Okay, so this one's actually a trick question. This item is new. 2.7 says, practice self-kindness and mindfulness and extend compassion to self if faced with feelings of inadequacy or failure. So let's talk a little bit about why we have a new code of ethics. Part of the rationale is that it really is related to current best practices. The Ethics Board researched aspirational codes of ethics in related health profession, uh, related allied health professionals like PTOT, psychology, and counseling, um, and sought to identify the facets of each of those that most closely align with Ethics Board work in music therapy. There were also changing and competing societal ideas about good, bad, right, and wrong. And another important reason in terms of this rationale was really um, upon advice from the American Music Therapy Association lawyer. Um, there were several items in the old code of ethics that were actually illegal uh, according to the Sherman Antitrust Act. The Sherman Antitrust Act is a comprehensive charter of economic liberty meant to preserve free and unfettered competition as the rule of trade. It outlaws every contract, combination, or conspiracy in restraint of trade and any monopolization, attempted monopolization, or conspiracy or combination to monopolize. So what that basically means is that a profession can't, within its code of ethics, say that it, um, it can't restrict somebody's right to work. And there were specific items within the old code that actually did that. Additionally, um, the ethics board, well, we all know that you can't create a code of ethics that is going to specify behavior for every action. And so part of the additional rationale was that they needed, the ethics board needed a code that didn't try to, um, didn't try to govern behavior quite as closely as the old code did because what people started to do was they found loopholes. 
the code of ethics said I can't do this, but it doesn't say that I can't do that. And even though the that may have been in spirit, exactly the same as the this, um, because the language was so specific, the that became a loophole for doing the thing that was quote unquote unethical or maybe uh, in the current terminology, ethically adequate. So, so this aspirational document sort of helped, um, was a way to try and close some of those loopholes. If you compare the two documents, there are significant changes just within the organization of the document. Um, it has a brand new preamble and purpose statement. It identifies eight core values for the profession. Um, and this code is organized by principles rather than by issues and also includes appendices of a glossary, decision-making models, and outlines the implementation and enforcement procedures. So the core values are these things you see here, kindness, social responsibility, dignity and respect, equality, accountability, excellence, integrity, and courage. These core values provide a foundation to guide music therapists in their practice and interactions. These core values should be considered in determining all ethical courses of action. So it's really a foundation for, for ethical thinking and for our practice here in the US. As I mentioned, the old code was organized by topic areas such as professional competence and responsibilities, general standards, relationships with clients, students, and research subjects, and so on and so, <coughs> excuse me, and so forth. Um, our new code is identified, I'm sorry, organized by core ethical principles. And these are the five principles, respect and dignity and rights of all, act with compassion, be accountable, demonstrate integrity and veracity, and strive for excellence. And the value, our core values are also reflected in these principles. So you might think that because it's only five principles, the document is short, right? Of course not. Um, each of these principles has sub items that are, um, that are items that help to uphold these, these particular standards. So just to do, give you a brief comparison so that you can get a sense of the old language versus the new language, because that's really, I think the, the heart of this new aspirational code is the differences in the language and the way we talk about things. So I know the print is small, um, but this section has to do with fees, um, fees and commercial activities. So there were, um, seven items in this in this section in the old code um, MT accepts remuneration only for services actually rendered MT will not take financial advantage of a client that emphasis is something that I added um, private fees may not be accepted no gratuities gifts or favors should be accepted that could interfere with um, decisions or judgments referral sources may not receive a commission fee the MT will not engage in commercial activities. The materials or products dispensed should be in the client's best interest and the client should have choice. So you can just again, to give you a sense of the language of the old code. And now because our new code is not um, organized by category, all of these items with the exception of that item in yellow um, are found within the code, but they're spread out because it's now related to the specific principles. That item in yellow that is deleted is because it is in direct um, conflict with the Sherman Antitrust Act. So, principle one, respect dignity and rights for all. Avoid accepting gifts or other um, considerations that could influence or give the appearance of influencing professional judgment. So again, just a difference in language. Be accountable. Principle three, work in a manner to reflect truthful and fair business practices that benefit clients, society, and the profession. Seek remuneration that is fair and reasonable. Um, offer services commensurate with training and corresponding scopes of practice, recognizing personal limitations. Principle four, demonstrate veracity and, uh, sorry, demonstrate integrity and veracity. Fully disclose any financial interest in products or services. 
um, ensure that billing and business practices are accurate and reflect the nature and extent of services provided. So if you notice the language in these particular items, um, the spirit of each item is, is the same as what was in the old code, but the letter of that language is different. And one of the things you might notice is that the word not does not appear in any of these items. And actually, I don't think the word not appears in the new code at all. Um, the word that is used most frequently is avoid. So the new code isn't telling us what to do. It's giving guidance. Avoid this versus don't do that. So um, as we think about this new code, um, and as we, as we as a profession have lived with it in the U.S. for about, like I said, about a year, it was adopted in February of 2019. Um, it's given me the chance to think about what is the impact of this new code on our profession. Um, one of the things that I think it does is it really increases the need for critical thinking because the code no longer, it, it no longer gives us that specific guidance. And so for people who in some instances just want to be told what to do, um, the code doesn't really do that quite as specifically as it used to. So it really requires us to use those decision-making models to work through the dilemma and, and, and come up with a solution that's in the best interest of our clients um, because the guidance isn't quite as specific as it used to be. Um, one of the other things that I wonder about um, in terms of our new aspirational code is, will the heart of ethical issues become more challenging to identify because they aren't as clearly defined within the code of ethics? So for music therapists who, uh, like myself, who knew the old code, um, it's easier, I think, for me to identify what the heart of an ethical issue is. But for a younger professional, um, I wonder if it will be how that will play out in terms of really identifying sort of the root of what the ethical dilemma is um, versus potentially getting stuck in all of the details. Because sometimes figuring out sort of what is, what is the root of the problem helps, helps us to work through it. But if we're getting stuck in all of the details, it, it can, can be a little more challenging. I also wonder if there will be differences in how the code of ethics is used or interpreted based on experience. So again, for somebody who knew the old code of ethics very, very, very well, um, they might take a different approach than a younger professional who only knows this code of ethics. Um, and only knows this aspirational approach. So for example, um, I wonder if younger professionals might take a different perspective on using te client testimonials than an older professional. Our old code of ethics was pretty explicit in, in that um, music therapists couldn't announce that, that announcing services had to be consistent with professional standards and not commercial standards. And testimonials fell under commercial standards. Um, but again, that's an item that is in violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act, so it was removed. Now, um, the guidance about testimonials is really found under the item in the new code 3.3, work in a manner to reflect truthful and fair business practices that benefit clients, society, and the profession. That is a very aspirational statement, and it's a little bit broad, um, and really requires a professional to, um, to think critically about whether or not it is ethically adequate or ethically excellent to use a testimonial. And again, because I'm a professional who knows, is familiar with the old code, um, Old habits die hard. So I might say, no, I'm not going to do that because I'm influenced by what I knew about the old code. Whereas a younger professional might say, eh, everybody's doing it. So it's okay. Um, which again, may or may not be ethically excellent. So um, again, I'm just curious about how experience may impact the way a professional interprets or uses this new aspirational code of ethics. And I think that 
it also creates some new challenges in terms of enforceability. I talked earlier about how um, the ethics board ran into challenges because people would find loopholes and ways around um, the specific items in the code because, you know, we could do this, but we can't do that. Well, now I think one of the new challenges is when you're thinking about aspirational ideals, those are, are, are things to, like I said, to which we aspire. And on some days, eh, I may not be as, you know, I may not be at my best that day and it may, um, you know, I may fall a little short. And these aspirational ideals are also a little bit subjective. Um, so one person's idea of really aspiring and another person's idea of falling short could be in conflict. And in that conflict, then there could be um, opportunities where somebody's going to go to the ethics board because they, they think that this other music therapist fell short of the aspirational standards. Now, the code does give us guidance in terms of enforceability. And it, in 3.13, it says that we should be familiar with the code of ethics, abide by its principles, and report witness violations to the ethics board, refraining from frivolous or punitive reporting. So hopefully in those subjective spaces, um, people won't go to the board for punitive reasons. But but I just think that it, it creates some new challenges in terms of how this aspirational code is enforced because it's much less cut and dried. You know, the, the bonus of having a do this or don't do that, uh, do this or don't do this is if you do it and you weren't supposed to, that behavior is, is easy to identify. But when it's aspirational, it, it's a little more challenging. Um, and lastly, I do think that, um, I do think this is a code that we'll have to live with for a little bit, um, but it'll be interesting to see what kinds of revisions could be in the future. So I um, thank you for the opportunity to share this information with you, and I look forward to questions and discussion. Hello, my name is Amy Clements Cortez. I'm assistant professor at the University of Toronto in the Faculty of Music, instructor and supervisor at Wilfrid Laurier University in the music therapy department, a registered psychotherapist, and a credentialed music therapist. I'm very honored to be here today to talk to you as one of the spotlight speakers in the Ethical Challenges in Music Therapy Spotlight Speaker Session. I will be speaking specifically about medical assistance in dying, looking at the challenges, considerations, and implications for music therapists. So to overview the talk, I'm going to give you a definition of what is medical assistance in dying, I'm going to look at the ethical implications for stakeholders, the ethical issues of music therapy in MAID, the role of music therapy in end of life, the potential role of music therapy in MAID, and then to look at future directions and research. But let's begin with a definition of what is medical assistance in dying. So essentially, medical assistance in dying permits individuals with terminal and grievous physical or psychological suffering to end their life using pathological means in the company of healthcare professional, such as a physician, a nurse, or a pharmacist. Definitions of MAID vary around the world, and MAID currently is available in Europe, Australia, North, and South America. Some of the legislation um, has some terminology and some implications that are not so clear. So for example, in the German legislation, while it does not criminalize suicide, it prohibits facilitation by a physician. On June 17th in 2016, Bill C-14 was passed outlining two types of MAID that include two forms of suicide that are legal in Canada. Physician assisted suicide, which is the self prescription of a lethal oral medication by the patient, and voluntary euthanasia, which is the administration of a lethal medication to the patient by a medical practitioner. 
Individuals may receive MAID if they meet a number of criteria. So for example, the minimum age requirement to make a competent medical decision is 18 or older. They must have the diagnosis of a serious or incurable illness, disease, or disability that is presented in advanced stages irreversible or with irreversible decline. Experiences of intolerable physical or psychological sufferance from the illness, the disease, the disability, or the state of decline that cannot be relieved by acceptable alternative methods. And natural death becomes a reasonable and foreseeable future which considers the patient's medical circumstances and remaining time of living. So where do ethical implications arise? So the stakeholders are the patient, they are the medical and healthcare professionals, as well as the community. So let's begin with the patient. Patients eligible for MAID expressed affirmative outlooks and feelings of control and autonomy with respect to their suffering. Many choose MAID due to a fear of future pain and suffering, a decreased pleasure in activities that they had enjoyed previously, feeling that they are somehow a burden to society and a burden to families, as well as challenges in communication. Ethical issues arise when individuals qualify for MAID, for example, but are left for long periods of time um, before the procedure takes place. So sometimes that could be the terminology. In Canada, for example, we have the terminology reasonable foreseeable future. But this does not guarantee that the procedure will be provided in any kind of expedited fashion. In fact, Bryden in 2017 found that in Canada, patients were waiting up to five years for the procedure in a number of cases. Safeguards, while very important, also cause further hardship, suffering, and delay. In Canada, there must be an assessment by two medical professionals not working together and a required 10-day waiting period from the time of the written request until the time of the procedure, and that the individual must also remain able to provide consent and demonstrate capacity at the time of the procedure. These factors may cause patients to re-examine MAID as delays of the services cause additional suffering. So for ethical implications of medical and healthcare professionals, physicians and nurses who provided MAID procedures after the bill was passed in Canada reported feeling honored and in that it was a large responsibility, but there were also many practical challenges. For example, the safe disclosure of personal opinions. In a Canadian Family Medicine Residency Program, 45% of residents and 33.3% of preceptors reported they felt competent in facilitating MAID, which is debated by the incomplete amount of education and fears regarding professionals feeling safe in disclosing personal opinions about MAID in medical environments. The definition of medical and healthcare professionals also presents ethical issues, as the list is very ambiguous. Narrow research supports a variety of mental health practitioners, for example, psychiatrists and music therapists, as valid stakeholders. Also important is to look at who wrote the legislation. By and large, it's a political community that has written and revised the legislation, and the ethical challenge that may factor in here is if the medical and healthcare community may not have the same professional language and practical knowledge. Medical and healthcare practitioners may also be faced with legal and professional practice challenges if there is a disagreement regarding a patient's eligibility for MAID and their protection as facilitators may therefore be reduced. In Canada, revisions of Bill C-14 could help in resolving or having a structure for anticipated logistical challenges in clinical practice. It might not seem so at first, but the community can also be impacted with ethical implications. For example, family and friends of an individual who qualifies for MAID are not exempt to the Canadian Criminal Code, and as such, it can limit the patient in requesting a kin to be part of their MAID process. In faith-based healthcare facilities, there is a lot of controversy surrounding MAID, and there are also clinicians' personal religious beliefs who can and uh, professional uh, physicians that campaign for religious exceptions to the Canadian bill. What we need is further legal interpretation that delineates kin and caregiver perspectives. There are several ethical issues that can be addressed with medical and healthcare professionals 
primarily as well that would um, extend to music therapists. These include music therapists and their choice of MAID administration, policies and guidelines for MAID implementation, as well as assessments and a determining patient eligibility in MAID. While MAID is a legal patient option, medical and healthcare practitioners have been found to be reluctant to provide MAID based on the scope of their clinical work. Canadian healthcare professionals are not obligated to provide MAID. However, if the physician does decline the process, they are required to provide a referral to who will administer the procedure on their behalf. As noted by Hoon Brown on your screen, just because doctors are regularly exposed to death doesn't mean they're comfortable performing euthanasia. So with respect to the field of music therapy, that issue is solved practically. Practitioners can refer the individuals to another physician and nurse because there is generally a large pool um, in any organization, especially compared to music therapy. But what happens when an organization employs a music therapist who is not comfortable in providing MAID? This situation can raise questions about the capacity of the healthcare organization to look for another music therapist, the additional costs, and the possible inability to appoint a secondary music therapist. These issues can impact the patient's request for MAID services and place tension or harm on the client to therapist music, a client to music therapist relationship. Although it may be a rare scenario for a patient to request a music therapist in the MAID procedure, there is a clear responsibility that we do need to provide this type of service. Further, healthcare professionals can experience a range of emotions in the MAID procedure, which places additional stress on them and their position. Booth and colleagues in 2018 expanded on this and shared an example of a group of nurses who had experienced emotional distress while providing care to a patient considering MAID. In addition to the stories of being positively impacted, nurses also described a range of emotions, some anticipated and others not. Music therapists may not have the option of participating in team debriefing or support groups to support them and help them regulate and process their acquired emotions from MAID, as the majority only work part-time in these settings, especially in Canada. This can result in professionals feeling isolated and emotionally vulnerable. Further, Booten and colleagues in 2018 found three qualitative themes in the nurses' perspectives of providing care in MAID. Nursing was a profession that aspired to provide holistic care without judgment, advocated patient choice and supported a good death. Nurses were well-respected pioneers in the healthcare system and understood that their emotional well-being and choice in their participation in MAID was valued. And comfort and competence were the nurses' priorities when they were interacting with patients who were seeking MAID. These themes support nurses, as well as potential MAID practitioners, including music therapists, showing that they require a healthy regulation in their emotions so that they can deliver quality services for their patients that is representative of their profession. In Canada, MAID can be administered by physicians. However, physicians and healthcare practitioners were not formally trained in this procedure during their schooling. This claim is further supported by the limited amount of resources or guidelines that are available for these professionals to reference on the appropriate performance measures of MAID. At the Princess Margaret Hospital, Dr. Madeline Lee, a Canadian physician, tasked an interdisciplinary team of health professionals to develop policies and procedures that outline the delivery of MAID. Lee states, we are actively ending a life and it's very new to us. Her comments support the need to establish a standardized methodology of the MAID process to the practitioner's perspective. The quote serves also as an ethical dilemma in the practice of medicine and music therapy, considering the role of a physician foremost is to save lives, cure illness, and MAID is quite the opposite. At present, there are no clinical guidelines for music therapists to base, to base their work with patients who have requested MAID services. I'm very pleased to share that a special interest group titled Music Therapy, Medical Assistance in Dying, facilitating a collective approach to creating clinical guidelines and implementing evidence-based practices has been formed by Dr. Sarah Rose Black, music therapist at Princess Margaret Hospital in Canada. The mandate of this group is to develop a series of clinical guidelines for music therapists in the engagement of MAID. 
The team is made up of not only music therapists, but other healthcare professionals, and I'm very honored to be a part of that team. Bill C-14 in Canada explains patient eligibility for MAID, which is grounded in a number of safeguards I spoke about earlier. These safeguards, however, create ethical dilemmas. For example, the bill does not take into account that an individual's cognition and physiological condition may decline while waiting for the MAID procedure. Due to the nature of a number of illnesses, cognition may decline from an individual being able to make a competent medical decision to being in a state of dementia. One way to circumvent such challenges would be to create advanced care directives and an honor system to ensure a cognitively impaired individual would be eligible for MAID without having to demonstrate informed consent when the MAID time arises. A challenge in advanced care directives would be in determining a date for the procedure given that an individual has little control over the disease progression. Creating a predetermined date for MAID would seem inaccurate in capturing best medical and healthcare practices. Both passive and active music therapy techniques are used in end-of-life care, such as improvisation, singing, songwriting, lyric analysis and discussion, among others. And these techniques are used to achieve a variety of goals in all of the domains, including the physical domain, the psychosocial, spiritual, etc. On your slide, you'll see some of the earlier references that support the role of music therapy in end-of-life care. So for example, reducing spiritual distress, reducing anxiety, decreasing blood pressure, heart and respiratory rates, as well as pain perception, assisting with life review, and facilitating reminiscence. On this slide, you'll see a little bit more up-to-date uh, view uh, of some of the studies. So, for example, Vessel and Dave in 2018 found that music therapy supported pain management, increased energy and quality of life, while also decreasing anxiety as measured through self-report. Schmidt and colleagues in 2016 showed that we had support in terms of pain management, control over self-regulation of emotions, increase in positive relationships with others as well as themselves, improvement in physical symptoms, relaxation, and physiological symptoms, things like heart rate, blood pressure. Gallagher and colleagues showed improvements in patients' mood levels, stress and anxiety, perceived pain, overall quality of life and acceptance of death. McConnell and Porter in 2017 showing improvement in physical comfort among other measures. Gutskell in 2013, again showing perceived pain decreased as well as improvements in pain management. And finally, Worth and colleagues in 2016 showing support for improvements in relaxation and wellness as well as in physiological symptoms like heart rate and blood pressure. And these are just some examples that I pulled from the literature for us. Due to the continual integration of music therapists and healthcare teams in work with individuals at end of life, music therapists may be called to offer the main procedure. According to Black, music can play a role at any point in a person's experience of illness and can equally be offered at any point during MAID, including during the assessment period, as well as the actual time of intervention, depending on the person's preferences and wishes. At the end of life, music therapy is a natural extension to MAID services. For example, music psychotherapy can enable the psychosocial processing of an individual's emotional and mental states while serving as a reflective tool to create opportunities for discussion which is important uh, to the client and for the client to discuss meaningful uh, things in their own life. I'm going to share a hypothetical case that I wrote regarding an older adult who has been receiving music therapy in an inpatient palliative care unit and is now considering MAID as his pain is escalating. The rationale for presenting a hypothetical case is that to date, no formal research case studies have described the inclusion of music therapy in the MAID process. So consider the case of Blake. A music therapist has been working with an end-of-life patient named Blake to achieve relationship completion with his partner, Paul. Paul has been present at the majority of music therapy sessions, and together they have engaged in clinical improvisation as well as songwriting to help them express important sentiments to each other, such as, I love you and thank you. 
Blake had considerable pain, which had been well controlled in the past few months when he first received his diagnosis of a terminal illness. However, the past few weeks, the pain has been escalating and Blake expressed a desire to have the made procedure. He had formed a therapeutic relationship quickly with the music therapist, and he felt strongly about having music therapy as part of the made procedure to help him relax and stay connected to his identity as he passed from this place to the next. He asked the music therapist if they then would be comfortable providing music and the music therapist agreed. Together in the days leading up to the procedure, they picked music Blake would like to have played, which includes songs he had written for Paul, as well as songs they had composed together. Made is a somewhat new procedure that necessitates further documentation in its success to ensure patient autonomy. It definitely is a responsibility for healthcare professionals as well to be writing about their work um, and dialoguing as well as to ensure uh, the safe and effective use of self. There's implications for family caregivers as well as faith-based communities. And what we can see really is that there's a need for research, descriptive writing, and definitely guidelines for the various healthcare professionals. The role of music therapists in palliative care has demonstrated robust potential in their ability to assist main procedures. Future research is suggested to evaluate potential legislative amendments to Bill C-14 in Canada based upon personal experiences of healthcare practitioners, including music therapists, as well as for patient safeguards, which have been limiting. As well, researchers should evaluate the ethical issues of made in palliative music therapy, which includes the availability of these specialized professionals to perform made and the possible strains that may arise in future client therapist, uh, client facilitator relationships. So I've provided just some selected references on the last few screens for you. I want to thank you very much for your time and I look forward to meeting and dialoguing with the question and answer period. Thank you very much. Good morning or afternoon or evening depending on where you're watching this from in the world. My name is Andadine Dos Santos and I'll be discussing ethical empathy in music therapy training and beyond. I began studying empathy and violence in the context of music therapy a few years ago. Looking back, I see that I started out with some simplistic and naive ideas around violence as bad and empathy as good. We should work to decrease the first and increase the latter. Now I know that violence is complex and it includes aspects that need to be understood in terms of how they function adaptively so that we can fully receive and compassionately work with clients who present this way. I've also learned that empathy is profoundly multifaceted. It can be expressed in highly ethical ways, but also in violent ways. The use of the term empathy in its singular form is still widespread, but I'd argue that this is incomplete and unhelpful. There are about 43 different definitions of empathy within current literature. A challenge is to recognize the many facets of the phenomenon whilst not inviting such vast conceptual spread that the idea comes apart altogether. Six types of empathy emerge prominently in current literature within the broad fields of human and social development, therapeutic approaches, and psychopathology. These are motor mimicry, largely overlapping with the concepts of embodied empathy and kinesthetic empathy, affective empathy, cognitive empathy, cultural empathy, and social empathy. The notion of musical empathy has also been explored within musicology, music psychology, music education, and music therapy. Empathy is referred to specifically in music therapy literature in a variety of ways, as you can see here. 
Sometimes the type of empathy referred to isn't specifically defined, and in some studies it's evoked in more blended forms. Empathy is key in the entirety of ethical decision making. REST proposed an ethical decision-making process that is still drawn upon today. It includes awareness and recognition of a moral issue, evaluation of the information and of alternatives, the intention to act, and behavioral follow-through. Empathy facilitates the whole of this process by informing moral recognition, judgment and evaluation, intention and action. Some studies indicate that the greater an individual's ability to take the perspective of others, the more likely she or he is to form ethical intentions. These perspectives on the close relationship between empathy and ethics are contentious though. Bloom has argued, for example, that moral concerns and empathy are not necessarily synonymous. In fact, they can clash. Empathy typically entails a focus on people in one's immediate vicinity and on the here and now. Empathy favors individuals over larger social groups. It can be biased and informed by racism, for example. Empathy can inspire violence as observed in wars, motivated by the protection of people like us against the others. Higher levels of empathy have been positively associated with violent behavior. Empathic mimicry can stimulate distress in an observer, which can then provoke aggression. An increased capacity for perspective taking has also been associated with greater relational violence as a result of empathic sadism. Empathic vampirism refers to a situation where the empathizer experiences the world vicariously through others without having their best interests at heart. As an effortful act, empathy can also be psychologically costly. And as a result, humans may prefer to avoid empathy. Also, if we are simply projecting our own view, then this is closer to silencing, appropriation or violence. Different theoretical orientations lead us to rather different understandings of empathy. For example, seeing another as a separate, bounded individual who one may attempt to empathize with may itself be a violent act. Gergen argued that relationships are ontological and a self is an emergent property of relationships. As such, empathy is less about trying to put oneself in the shoes of another separate self and more about exploring a relational process that is becoming between us. When one's connectivity is real and apparent, it is more difficult to do harm to the other. Alternatively, another theoretical perspective values acknowledging separation and difference. Clohesi, for example, wrote of ethics as involving a process of leaving home. The unsettling aspect of the empathic experience of difference is the utmost, sorry, is of the utmost ethical significance. Because ultimately, ethics must be about guiding us away from the familiarity and security of home to the more unfamiliar and inhospitable terrain of difference. Ethical engagement requires not only valuing a world in which other worlds are possible, but allowing and even participating in the thriving of those worlds. Grappling with ethics is an intrinsic part of music therapy training. An ethical classroom becomes a relational space where connections among habituated ways of knowing, coming to know and being are more fluid than fixed, more open than determined. Learning takes place through engaging with ethical deliberations, as these are situated within socio-historical claims regarding what knowledge is, what can be known, and how we can access 
this knowledge. As a music therapy lecturer, I spent last year diving into an exploration of empathy with my master's students. In the study, the students and I critically explored various experiential encounters, projects, discussions, and reflections on clinical practice. The study was guided by the questions, what kind of empathies are produced and reflected upon here? And in what ways could these empathic engagements and, re and reflections be considered as ethical or not? Through thematic analysis of the data, five kinds of empathies emerged. Empathy towards the self, resonant empathy, which incorporated affective and kinesthetic forms, reflective empathy, which linked to cognitive and psychological empathy, translational empathy, and relational empathy. Importantly, each of these empathies were expressed in both more ethical and more violent forms. And I'll discuss this further in a moment. Identification and shared situations also emerged as related concepts. Identification arose as experiences of having the sense of another person being the same as oneself in terms of a or many key features, or as having the same experience that one has had personally. Whilst there can be some overlaps with empathies, identification retains a focus on the self. Being in a shared situation did not imply that one was necessarily having an empathic response towards the person that one was sharing the situation with. Today I'll be focusing, focusing specifically on the different forms of empathy that emerged and their varied expressions. As I looked closely at each type of empathy that was reflected in the data and investigated how they were being expressed in these more ethical and more violent forms, I considered Carl Rogers' description of empathy. This is a well-known one. According to Rogers, empathy involves entering the private world of the other and becoming thoroughly at home in it. It involves being sensitive to the changing felt meanings which flow in this person. It means temporarily living in his or her life, moving about in it delicately without making judgments, sensing meanings of which he or she is scarcely aware. To be with another in this way means that for the time being you lay aside the views and values you hold for yourself in order to enter the world without prejudice. I realized that the different forms of empathies that were emerging in my data could be described through reconfiguring this definition, both in their ethical forms and in their more violent forms. This table that you are probably struggling to see on this slide, but I'll zoom in in a moment, shows a map of empathies that I've developed. Each of the five types are included, and on the left is a summary of their more ethical form, while on the right is a summary of their more violent form. Each type of empathy can be considered as a path. We walk along each path between more ethical and more violent expressions. The map invites critical considerations of these multiple empathies, as they may be more and less appropriate in different contexts, in relation to different theoretical orientations, and in terms of their use within different practices. Rather than presenting different empathies in a hierarchical structure, the map is flat, offering the strengths of different empathies in light of different aims and different forms of relating. So let's look at this map a bit more closely. As a music therapist, it may be relevant to ask oneself whether one is willing to and well versed at dwelling within one's own life world. It is necessary to exercise self-empathy in order to be able to, to offer empathy to others. According to Brucia, music therapy is a reflexive process in which we need to make continuous efforts to bring into awareness, evaluate, and when necessary, modify our work with the client. This is achieved through activities such as self-observation and self-inquiry. When dwelling in one's own life world, in order to observe and inquire is practiced ethically. This entails self-kindness instead of harsh criticism, an awareness of common humanity 
and mindfulness instead of avoidance. Dwelling within one's own life world can, however, take on different qualities. Some that ethically leave room for recognition that others may dwell in their own life, life world differently, and others that more violently assume that the view that one's personal experience is the only valid one. Music was highlighted as being particularly evocative of emotional and embodied responses. As we sense and share in the emotional and embodied experience of the other through resonant empathy, and loosen our grip on our own prior state to share in the state of another with vulnerability. It appears that this can occur with greater and lesser awareness of who the experience originally belongs to. Participants in this study raised concerns about ensuring the psychological safety of the client as this is negotiated. Empathic over-arousal can promote self-focus, personal distress, and the desire to alleviate one's own negative feelings. More optimal levels of empathic arousal require self-regulation in order to retain an other-directed focus, even while sharing in a resonant experience. Participants asserted the importance of remaining in any discomfort that arises in the session, as this may bring insight and growth rather than attempting to escape from it or trying to pull the client away from it. Reflective empathy took shape as dwelling humbly and respectfully in the imagined life world of the other, moving about in it delicately without judgment or prejudice. Examples also emerged in the data, however, of entering a private world of the other by assuming that one understands their experience and simply bringing one's own biases, personal beliefs and personal discomforts to bear on the encounter. A number of strategies were experienced as helpful, such as listening to other stories, listening carefully to the quality of a client's silence, becoming familiar with another's context and with the context of a piece of music, and building trusting relationships over time. Musicking within a therapeutic relationship was highlighted as being particularly useful in getting to know a client and their life world, especially when speech is limited. At times, it was only through the musical relationship that my students felt they were able to get to know their client, and through experiencing musical matching and reflection that the client appeared able to feel known. What if I don't believe that I can stand in your shoes? Who am I to claim to understand your experiences? Empathy, then, may invite dwelling in the negotiated and dynamic dance of translation. We become generously aware of each other and move together communicatively with humility and curiosity, whilst recognizing similarities and connectedness, and also respecting and even enjoying difference, separateness, and complexity. Conflict and a lack of full commensurability can remain central as part of a translational empathic process. These do not need to be neutralized by empathy. Mistranslations can also be opportunities for transformation and discovery. The participants highlighted the need to recognize past and present injustice and their own roles in this in order to foster empathic relationships. Also, in addition to the quality of the therapeutic space, Empathy requires participation in the creation of a just system more broadly. When a relational ontological approach is assumed, then empathy changes shape again as a process of relationally rooted becoming. Here, we do not conceive of one another as bounded selves, but are always already emerging from relationship. This relational path of empathy could be characterized by an awareness of interconnectedness and mutuality in its more ethical form, or by unequal power relations or denial of interconnectedness in its more violent form. Participants in this study explored how their views, behaviors, and experiences were shaped through their interactions with others. As higher levels of empathy, 
have been significantly associated with better therapeutic outcomes in health professions. It would be remiss of us as music therapy practitioners and educators not to be intentional about creating spaces to explore and practice empathy. Crucially though, the notion of empathy itself requires critical examination. It is not a unitary phenomenon, and it is not only a pro-social and ethical form of engagement. I've developed a version of this map that serves as a reflexive tool for practitioners and students to use in their work. Broadly, it invites questions about what form or forms of empathies may be most appropriate in a given context and why this may be the case. How does a particular empathy path serve the needs of the client? How does walking along this path assist in moving the process towards its therapeutic aims? How does a certain path align with one's value system and theoretical orientation? How might a type of empathy that is being expressed by the music therapist be experienced by the client? It also invites specific questions as one looks more closely at each of the paths. In relation to empathy towards the self, how am I dwelling in my own life world? In a situation, am I entering my own world and becoming thoroughly at home in it? How does the way I dwell or don't dwell in my own life world relate to my relationships with others? In terms of resonant empathy, how am I dwelling in the experience of the emotional state of another person? How am I dwelling in the qualities of the embodied presence of this person? In a particular situation, am I sharing in the emotional and embodied world of the other and becoming immersed in it? Am I sensitive to the op and open to the changing feelings and movements which flow in this person? Or am I sharing in the emotional and embodied world of the other and becoming overwhelmed by it, such that I'm becoming lost in my own experience at their expense? In relation to reflective empathy, how am I dwelling humbly and respectfully in the imagined life world of this person? How am I moving about in his or her life delicately without making judgments and without prejudice? Or am I entering the private world of the other and assuming that I am thoroughly at home in it? Am I moving about in their, in their life forcefully, clumsily or with judgment? In relation to translational empathy, how are we dwelling in the negotiated and dynamic dance of translation? Are we both becoming generously aware of each other and each other's worlds according to how we each choose to share this and becoming thoroughly open to developing dynamic ways of understanding each other? Or, as we negotiate the dynamic process of translational empathy, are one or both of us experiencing the other as too forceful or too distant too invasive or too invested? Are we really working with and towards collaborative generosity? In terms of relational empathy, how are we dwelling in shared, mutual, relationally rooted becoming? How are we realizing our mutuality and interconnectedness without prejudice? How are we open to affecting and being affected by each other? Or are we becoming through unequal power relations that support my perceived superiority, power relations that I've become thoroughly at home in. And am I moving about in this relationship with moral authority, reinforcing meanings that I've already produced? My hope is that understanding empathy more deeply and practicing empathy with more awareness, critical thinking and humility will contribute to our increasingly ethical and compassionate practice as music therapists. Thank you for your time today. Hello, everybody. My name is Trinjul Stige still, and it's my pleasure to moderate this discussion following these presentations. So I think I would like to start by thanking everybody for being present. And lots of people have been listening to these presentations. And I want to thank the four presenters for 
having very nice and stimulating presentations, quite diverse actually, which is very beautiful, coming from different contexts, different perspectives. Uh, and I also want to thank you, the organizers in Pretoria or Tsvane, for for organizing this this conference in this fantastic way, which we didn't anticipate, but which seems to be working uh, in its own way. That's fascinating. So we have a few minutes for uh, for discussion. Uh, there has been a lot of interesting comments in the chat. There's been questions in the questions and answers. So we will probably not be able to relate to all of that material. So I hope that the conference will be able to archive uh, those things so that they could be accessed uh, afterwards. I, I think uh, I would like to open the discussion with um, one question which was asked to uh, Professor Verdi van Staden uh, about, from an ethical point of view, who decides what kind of music therapy a client should receive? And Verdi has al already answered the question, uh, saying that I would recommend that this very question be subject to shared decision making between client and therapist. And for me, it's very difficult to be to disagree with that. Uh, response, but I I assume that we all might perhaps or perhaps not. Let's see. Agree that shared decision making is a very complex process. Uh, there might be challenges to communication. Obviously, if you work with people with dementia or uh, language problems or uh, psychosis, but also in ma for many other reasons, there might be quite a bit of a difference between the two partners when it comes to competencies, knowledge, power in the relationship. Uh, so I would like to ask uh, the panel, the presenters, if you have comments about the possibilities and the pitfalls of, of that process of shared decision making, which would be kind of one attempt to relate ethically to the question of who's actually having access to music therapy. Any comments from the panel upon this? Perhaps I can um, respond to that and say, we should be careful about being mean with shared decision making and not think that it's shared decision making if you know if the therapist come up with all the solutions and the, 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 the client just has to choose that's not shared decision making mm -hmm. sometimes i mm -hmm. hear people think that that would be shared decision making no shared decision making is really to take the values of each other seriously um by you know what what you as a therapist would say is professionally important what why i would say this kind of therapy is um, the the better one in this instance and that would value the, the kind of therapy that kind of therapy in this circumstance more um, and then to hear how the the client is evaluating that in terms of his or her needs at that or perceived needs at that point in time and and then to say well let's what are we going to decide together considering that I would think this is this is the the, 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 the cause of action and um, and um, how you would evaluate that but if I would say you know I really think we'd need to uncover these unconscious processes for example through a dynamic process of um, and the other person said I'm very scared of what's going on in my unconscious you know I think that would really be a really important uh, a reason to reconsider whether indeed um, you know, you should pursue a, a dynamic kind of, of, of work. Um, so I think, um, just to say I have to do what the, what the patient or the client is wanting, that would also be mistaken. That would be in defiance of your professional value. So shared decision making is not just do whatever the client would want. That would be in defiance of your legitimate professional values. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Do you want to comment upon this, Debbie? Yeah, um, I think one of the other challenges when I look at that question about who decides what kind of music therapy, 
There are also sort of practical challenges that go along with that. What if you're the only music therapist for 500 miles? And so you have um, maybe limitations in your own competence and those kinds of things. So I think that's the other challenge in terms of who decides. Um, obviously, it's ideal when we can um, involve the client in that process. But um, again, depending depending on location, um, the thing that might be ideal for the client may not be an, an area where the therapist has the skill. Hmm. Hmm. That, that would be part of the values that's brought to the table, sorry. That, that that I don't have that particular the skills for that particular kind that would be the precisely the values that you would bring as professional to your to that decision making it's not just the professional values it's also you as your personal values as a professional in that particular situation or I haven't done that kind of music therapy for years I don't feel comfortable with that or I feel so uncomfortable about with that kind of therapy that I cannot provide that sensibly to you because I'm going through personal difficulties in my life for that matter. So I think that's part of the values that ought to be part of that discussion. Sorry. Can I say something? Okay. I think also the idea of shared decision making. Are we just talking about the music therapist and the client in the room? Or are we also looking at what is in the best interest of a family system, a community, and how do we think of inviting communication um, and, and a sharing of that decision-making in broader context? Because also what I might want to do as an individual might be against someone else's best interest, and how do we help communities thrive by inviting a broad notion of, of shared decision-making? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that... That comment leads to to my another question, which I think uh, has kind of emerged from your presentations. It's uh, the fact that you could look at ethics at kind of different levels of analysis. Several of you were thinking about that, you know, ethics as part of interpersonal relationships and as part of the profession's relationship to society. And it's it's quite clear from the presentations in in some countries. Euthanasia is forbidden in some countries. It's an integrated part of, of the healthcare system. And uh, Debbie talked about how creating awareness of the profession was no longer considered part of the ethical guidelines. And, and the logics of that might change if you have a market from a market-driven healthcare system to a state-funded public healthcare system where, where unfair access and the need to create awareness about the profession is actually a very ethical uh, question. Um, so all of this is very much also related to you know our, our political systems and our healthcare systems. And uh, I wondered if you would have comments upon how our music therapy associations and as academics, we could we need to work in order to kind of draw attention to those broader social and political and cultural aspects of, of ethical challenges. <laughs> and I think for me, the, the issue there is also how our profession relates to other professions. If we look at yeah. our country at the moment and the current, we're in a, um, a few years of moving towards a national health um, system that is more equitable. And we also sit in a context where we've got very few music therapists and vast psychosocial needs. And whilst we do recognize and, and respect our scope of practice, we also have tricky questions about how we relate to other um, practitioners who use the arts in healing in multiple different ways and and what are our ethical guidelines in terms of navigating those complex relationships again for the best interest not only of our profession but of the communities that we serve and so we are in our context currently involving involved in rich and creative and sometimes difficult conversations about um, those professional boundaries and relationships, and obviously ethics is highly intertwined in all of those conversations too. Exactly. 
There doesn't seem to be any, to any other comments to this. So I can just make a comment myself that I feel that this, this issue that Andaline is talking about kind of reveals how the issue of ethics is also very much revealed to another at, uh, topic for another spotlight here, namely the issue of access to services and, and uh, the issues of social justice in society. Uh, if you're a tiny profession and try to create a monopoly around the use of music as a health resource, we are actually privileging very small groups in society. But at the same time, we need to kind of make sure that the issues of quality and, and ethical practice are taken care of. So these are absolutely complex conversations. I can see that time actually is running very, very quickly. We are supposed to, to end in a few moments. So I think I would like to close this session by giving uh, the word to each one of you. If you have any comment upon uh, the presentations or the discussion so far. Um, would you like to, to start, Amy? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I really enjoyed um, each of the presentations today, and I can see that there's a thread, um, even though they were quite diverse. I mean, um, in terms of um, just, I think, connecting um, in terms of the relationships and the different stakeholders that are involved in ethics. I did want to just um, highlight, there was a question from Lucy Forrest about um, comfort, a clinician comfort and anxiety in participating in the final stages of medical assistance in dying. And I think that is a, a big ethical question. I think um, mm. it's got to be, um, it's important that a clinician would feel comfortable expressing, you know, if they have feelings of discomfort or they have anxiety. And I think this is something that perhaps needs to also be involved in the education and training. Um, it's not uncommon for music therapists who work in end of life care to um, be with a patient when they're actively dying um, not during a made procedure, but when they are actively dying, are very close to dying. So I think um, overall, that individuals that are going to work in palliative care would be important to have that as part of the education and training is to talk about that anxiety and that comfort. And, and also just being true to oneself and knowing if we can work with that population. Not everyone is, is able to work in all populations. Um, given what is going on in our own current situations and being true to ourselves and what uh, Dr. Andaline spoke about with in terms of um, the empathy and, and Carl Rogers in particular, um, I think resonates very well with um, people that are working in palliative care and perhaps especially with respect to medical assistance in dying. I thank you everyone for your time. Thank you, Amy. Let's go from uh, from Canada to the US. Do you want to say something, Debbie? Sure. Um, I did want to say, um, Verdi, that I, I greatly enjoyed your strawberry exercise. I thought that was a wonderful illustration and just um, part of what makes ethics, I think, engaging to talk about is finding ways to engage all of us. So I thought that was really a great, in, um, a great illustration. Um, and Andaline, I think you really highlight the complexities of empathy. Um, and I look forward to reading more about what you've done. Mm -hmm. And Aline, would you like to say a few words? I just wanted to thank all of you for your fascinating presentations. I felt um, grateful to be part of this panel and to learn and hear from all of you. So thank you and thank you for your as well. Thank you. Uh, Verde. I think our time is up, so I just say thank you for the great presentation, sir. Okay. <laughs> so I will do the same. Uh, it was very interesting. Uh, and obviously, it's, it's you know, this is something we need to continue to talk about uh, in, in the profession. We have already been doing it, of course, for years, but uh, these presentations have given new perspectives that we need to think about. We started today with a beautiful song in Swahili, Kiswahili. So 
saying Jumbo and Habarigani. So I guess we should say goodbye in Kiswahili too. So I would say Kwaheri. Kwaheri. Thank you, everybody, for joining. <laughs>